So now the fun part. Um, if you're here, you're probably here because you already know who our speakers are, but, um, <laughs> but I was told I needed to introduce them, so I'm gonna do that. Uh, Andy Borowitz is a New York Times bestselling author. He writes the political satire, The Borowitz Report in The New Yorker. His latest book is Profiles in Ignorance, How America's Politicians Got Dumb and Dumber. And he now lives in Hanover, and we're very fortunate that he supports our local community in lots of ways. So thank you for being here. And with him on stage is going to be Mitch Wertlieb. And Mitch Wertlieb has more than 20 years of experience in radio news, so we know we can be confident he'll be comfortable up there on stage, uh, including six years at WBUR in Boston. And most of us in this room probably know his voice as the host of Morning Edition on Vermont Public, which he's done since 2003. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to our remarkable speakers, Andy Borowitz and Mitch Wortley. Wow, thanks. Thanks. Introduction. Yeah, thanks for coming out. Thanks for that lovely. What an amazing crowd. This is more people than showed up for both of Trump's arraignments, I've got to say. <laughs> together, which we is incredible. We a really good start, yeah. Did you, did you have a favorite arraignment? Uh, oh, you know, you never forget your first arraignment. That's so, true. To me, that was so really New York. the best one, the New York one. It's funny. I, I, I don't want to take anything away from the New York arraignment. It was an awesome arraignment, but um, I think I like Florida better. Did you? Because afterwards, he was so gracious because he invited all these people to Cuban restaurant um, to dine with him for free. And then, and then he left without paying the bill. Um, <laughs> it's interesting, like, the only time he's actually ever paid somebody was Stormy Daniels, which caused the first arraignment. <laughs> So it New comes York. full circle, really. It does. Because you get right down to it. Well, I will say one thing. When I say something is free, it is actually free. And um, I think, just out of curiosity, how many people here tonight were especially attracted by the price point of tonight's event? <laughs> yes. My price point, I, it's so important as a performer to know your price point. Yes. Mine hovers around zero dollars. Right. And uh, it, we got a great, but I want to tell you one thing tonight. This is my promise to you, you will get your money's worth. You really will. Really. There is a catch, however. What is that? Because I work in public radio, and so I ask for money for a living. So oh, no. If we ask folks for money at the end, you know, there's going to be that price point. That's true. Yeah. But there is actually a good, there's a good premium that you have in your hand right there. Yes, look at that. Look at that. And, and you get, um, what do you get membership in if you get that premium? I guess just, um, I will like you then. Yes. How's that? Like you will get you so membership much. in me liking you. And we're neighbors now. This whole Hanover thing is fantastic. I, I mean, know. A lot of people, did you know that Andy was this close by now? Yes. This yeah. is fantastic. I didn't know. Talk about profiles and ignorance. It's I amazing. No How many people here have visited Hanover recently? <laughs> we have some, you know, you're, if you haven't, you're missing out. We have some great restaurants. We have this restaurant called um, CVS. <laughs> um, it's incredible. They have a whole beverage section, sandwiches. You got to check it out. You should come to South Burlington. We have this place called Walgreens. Which oh, is that is. I've heard good things about oh, it it's in Zagat. I've heard good. good things about it. Can I can I read some of your recent Andy Barowitz report headlines? Sure. Just go a ahead. couple that I that have really caught uh, because you know the Barowitz report, you know, like the Onion, one of the great satirists uh, of our time here. So I was wondering about this one because again, you just don't know what's real or not anymore. Right? No. It's a Fox fine line. News apologizes for, quote, regret regrettable flirtation with accuracy. Yes. <laughs> that actually happened. Yeah, I had, had to look Brett at that Bayer. one twice to make sure that that was an actual satirical. Right. It was the Brett, Brett Bayer actually stated some truth hoods on Fox News, which is really bad for their brand. Some actual tough questions. Yeah. For a he, said that, he said that Trump lost the election was very alienating to the audience. I oh, think news, news to some people. Yes. Skeptics question whether Pence has more to offer than raw sexual magnetism. Yeah. <laughs> uh, spoiler alert, he does not. <laughs> that is what he is all about. That's right. Um, it's just an animal. <laughs> <laughs> and as we were just talking about the second arraignment, Miami police searching for a defendant with 71 felony counts who skipped out on a restaurant check. Yeah, that's right. 
he does not have a weapon, but he has documents that show the locations of a weapon. So <laughs> he, is, he is dangerous. You must have a lot of fun writing these, but at the same time, hasn't it become harder to write these given the last four, eight, ten years or so? Well, yeah, you know, it's funny because, um, you know, there's a long, I'm like about the 900th person who's done this job. And, and you go back in American history, and Will Rogers at the turn of the century, of the last century, was the most famous American political satirist. And he had a great line, which I quote all the time. He said, there's no trick to writing political satire when you have the whole government working for you. <laughs> so it really hasn't changed. I mean, it is, it's right. really hasn't changed. But when, when Trump was elected, people would come up to me, or they would say on Facebook, whatever, they would say, like, oh, you've got it so easy now. You know, the jokes will write themselves. And it's actually, that is the opposite of the truth. Because my job, if you can call it that, is to take reality and make it more ridiculous. And with Trump, that was impossible. Because, <laughs> because I would literally, and this happened all kinds of times, I would try to think of the most insane thing he could possibly do. And then 10 minutes later, he would do that thing. So my news was no longer fake. It was just early. <laughs> and it was like, breaking news. And uh, that is, it wasn't really the idea. And it was, so it's, it's actually, it's much easier to write about people who are trying to be serious, like Mike Pence or Mitt Romney, people like that are more enjoyable for me because you can have them do something insane and that's funny. There's no um, surprise to Trump doing something crazy. Sometimes with Trump, the only way to sort of skin that cat is to try to take him, whatever he's saying, whatever gaslighting he's doing to us, take it very, very literally and, uh, and very seriously and that, that can become absurd. I'll get, can I give you one example of Please that? Please do, yes. So, um, when I mentioned Stormy Daniels, uh, one of my favorite actors, and uh, she, she uh, when that whole scandal first came out when Trump was president, and it turned out that um, he, through Michael Cohen, his, his lawyer, had provided her with $150,000, um, Michael, Michael Cohen was cornered, and some, some news people said, well, um, isn't this hush money for having sex with Donald Trump? And he said, and this is Trump logic here, yeah. he said, and he expects us to believe this, he says, um, she didn't have sex with Donald Trump, but we were afraid that she was going to say that she had sex with Donald Trump, and so we paid her $150,000 not to say that. <laughs> so I looked at that and I said, well, wait a minute, I have also not had sex with Donald Trump. <laughs> So where's my check? You know, it's like, so that was, that was, um, you know, so that's what I mean by taking him seriously. It's almost like he's always saying these things. Like, I love that he says that, that Joe Biden has 1,500 boxes of documents in Chinatown. I mean, it's just such a, and he says like, and they don't even speak English. Okay. <laughs> what is that? I mean, I just love, just if you start parsing that and taking it seriously, it becomes funny because you can't make his statements more ridiculous. Right, I mean, there's no way you can do that. No. But there's competition, too, because then you have people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, mm -hmm. who, with a straight face and, and thinking that she's going to scare people, talks about this, the, gazpa the gazpacho police. The gazpacho police, <laughs> yes, who will, who will hurl spicy food at us. Uh, I um, didn't I, know tomato soup was a crime. I, no. I, I actually have a soft spot in my heart for, for Marge because um, <laughs> she, of course... She, of course, very famously um, referred to, and they weren't her exact words, but she did speak about the threat posed by Jewish space lasers. And um, as, as a member of the tribe, I've got to say, I was extremely flattered. Um, I was flattered that she thought I could operate a space laser. I mean, I have, I have trouble muting myself on Zoom, all right? I mean, you laugh, but Zoom is trickier than it looks. I mean, it is. if Jeff Tubin knew how to use Zoom, he'd still be on CNN. Okay, so. As a fellow member of the tribe, can confirm. We need instructions. Absolutely. You can't just press a button and expect space lasers to start wildfires. No, not at all. Yeah. Not at all. But you I, know, I love her. It does seem to me, though, that yes, these things are funny, but they've also put us in a really scary place. And the thing that I loved about your book, though, was that you really did show that this didn't come out of nowhere. We didn't wake up one day in 2016 and have to deal with all this word salad, you know, and, and in 2020 uh, talking about having bleach in, injected into us to get rid of COVID. Mm -hmm. 
this has been going on for a while, and you did a lot of research here, and we have had some not-so-bright presidents before, Warren G. Harding, if you want to go all the way back there. Mm -hmm. Although I kind of defend Warren G. Harding. One thing, one thing I would say about this book, just, for, just as you know, sort of a buyer's advisory, uh, is it's not, nothing in it is made up. It's 100% factual. That's not to say it's not funny, because I have great comedy writers working for me, like Sarah Palin and, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Michelle Bachman. Can we remember her? She was wonderful. Um, Ron Paul, of course. Uh, but um, it, I did, you know, what's, I started thinking that I would, you know, this was sort of a COVID lockdown project. And I started thinking, well, if I just collected all these insanely stupid things that these politicians have said, that'll just be kind of a light romp and a laugh riot. But then the more I kind of nerded out and actually did the research and got sort of deeply into the history, I actually realized there's, there is some history here worth investigating because maybe it does teach us a little bit about how we got here. Not that I, you can't teach that in an entertaining way. Right. But it's, there's nothing in it that's made up, as much as that's hard to believe when you read some of the things that are in the book. Well, you break the book down into these really digestible sections that make a lot of sense. Uh, because we're talking about the age of, of ignorance, and like, there's the stages. So there's the stage of ridicule. There's the mm -hmm. stage of acceptance. And then the stage that we're in now, which is celebration. Yes, ignorance. ridicule, acceptance, and celebration. That's talk, right. to, talk a little bit about the first stage, ridicule, and which politician most uh, personifies that stage? Well, the one thing that's important is, like, I, I do stress that we've always had dumb politicians. So I'm not saying this is a new development. I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. Do we have any Clevelanders here? Oh, a couple. <laughs> Showing tremendous pride as they <laughs> meekly Slight wave. wave their hands and then <laughs> slink out the back way. <laughs> Um, but in, in Go Browns. when I was a kid um, in Cleveland, we had a mayor named Ralph J. Perk, and that's his actual name. And he was famous mainly for one thing, which was that he, uh, in, the, in the 70s, had to preside over something called um, the uh, Exhibition of the American Society for Metals. And it was like a trade show. This was really sort of the pinnacle of excitement in my youth, actually, in Cleveland. Um, and uh, so somebody had the bright idea that Ralph J. Perk, instead of having a ribbon cutting, um, since it was a metals theme, oh, they would have a, a titanium ri um, ribbon that he would then bisect with a blowtorch. <laughs> so no one bothered to ask, like, have you ever used a blowtorch before? Or say, hey, maybe offstage you want to try out the blowtorch. What could possibly go like, wrong? Well, what went wrong was that um, <laughs> He set his hair on fire. <laughs> and this is available, by the way, on YouTube, thankfully. So when you get home, Ralph J. Perk, hair on fire. It'll be right there. Um, but it was really unfortunate timing because a few years earlier, the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland had also caught on fire. And just as sort of a municipal kind of piece of wisdom is, you know, if your river catches on fire, I think most people will give you a free pass. But if your river and your mayor catch on fire, that can start to affect tourism. So, so yeah, so like Will Rogers said, there have always been dopes in politics. It seems to attract a lot of them. But something, the area that I dis discuss in this book is really kind of the last 60 years. And I didn't choose that randomly, because the six, last 60 years are what we sometimes laughingly call the information age. It's when mass media really started becoming a factor in our lives. And it started with television. Some people would say radio, but really television, um, cable television, CNN, mm. Fox, the internet, and now social media. So we, it really changed what kind of candidates we got and what kind of candidates succeeded. And the, pivot, the pivotal point um, probably was 1960 which was the first televised presidential debate between Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy. Both of them were extremely well-informed. Um, and people who listened to the debate on the radio actually thought that Nixon had won the debate. But people who saw it on television thought that Kennedy won the debate because Kennedy was much better looking. He had much more command. He had much better hair. Hair Nixon is incredibly. Sweat too, yeah, right? Nixon yeah. was sweaty. He, he looked like he needed a shave. He, he just looked like he wasn't somebody you'd trust. How deceptive appearances can be. <laughs> so 
Board but, misunderstood Richard Nixon. I know. So, <laughs> so what this, in a way, this taught the exact wrong lesson to people who were in politics because in 1966, some Republican millionaires in California wanted to get the governor's mansion back into Republican hands. And they said, we need to have somebody who's good on television. And so they kind of reverse engineered this problem. Instead of finding somebody who was knowledgeable, like Kennedy or Nixon, um, who then could be trained to be good on television, they found somebody who had lots of experience being on television, who didn't know <laughs> but could be coached into seeming like he knew and that was Ronald Reagan. So Ronald Reagan was really the kind of, you know, the guy who got the party started here because he didn't know anything. He, he was, everything that he was taught to say was in very like simple phrases and cue cards. Like, you know, tear down that wall. I mean, tremendous command of monosyllabic words, you know. <laughs> but that, you know, so things like that he could be coached into. And, you know, just some of the things that actually Ronald Reagan didn't know. I mean, he never read anything. He didn't read books in college. He never read when he was at the White House. And there's a moment where his, um, his chief of staff, James Baker III, leaves this big, in a, in a moment of tremendous optimism, he leaves this big briefing book on his desk because they're going to have this important trade meeting the next day with some foreign powers. And he goes in the next morning into the Oval Office and he sees that the book has not been cracked. I mean, it's just sitting exactly where he left it. And uh, he says, um, um, Mr. President, um, did you read the book? And he says, well, no. And he, says, um, and he says, why not? And he says, well, Jim, the sound of music was on TV last night. <laughs> so that's Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, just some of the ignorance of Ronald Reagan, you know, he thought you could store all the waste generated from a nuclear power plant under your desk. I guess it de depends on the size of yeah, your I desk, suppose, so yeah. theoretically. He did not know that South America was composed of different countries. Right. Um, that's what he discovered after visiting South America as president of the United States. And he thought that trees emitted more lethal fumes than automobiles. And when he, when he was campaigning for president in um, 1980, he visited Claremont College in California, and some students there tacked a sign on one of the trees that said, chop me down before I kill again. <laughs> so, but he won the race in California by a million votes. He won by a landslide in 1980, 1980 1984, yeah. and that, again, just reinforced this lesson that if you found somebody who was good looking on TV, they didn't need to know anything, and that led us to the other icon of the ridicule phase. Um, and I should say, when I say the ridicule phase, what I mean is this is a bygone era in our politics in the age of ignorance where dumb politicians had to appear to be smart. So Reagan had to appear that he knew enough. Um, so they'd boil things down into sound bites so he could seem knowledgeable. The, the second experiment in this ridicule phase that was not so successful, even though it was working on the exact same principle, was Dan Quayle. Oh, yes. Who can and forget? Who can forget Dan Quayle? And Dan Quayle was George H.W. Bush's vice presidential nominee in 1988. All of the Republicans around him, all the Republican advisors, all of whom were men, had an enormous crush on Dan Quayle. They said they, he looked like Robert Redford. They said he looked like Robert Redford. You know who else thought he looked like Robert Redford was Dan Quayle. <laughs> Dan, Dan Quayle even used that when he first ran for the Senate in Indiana. His early slogan was, here's a guy who's even better looking than Robert Redford. Um, and they thought that was a really good, that was a good sort of credential uh, for being in the Senate. And I, I must say, I am very hard on Dan Quayle in the book, and I have felt bad about it, because um, I don't feel like I give him a chance to defend himself. And I, I actually reached out to him before Bookstock to see if he would join us on stage. <laughs> I mean, I'm fair. I'm a very fair person, as, of as all of you know. And um, I reached out to him, and he actually responded with an email. He said that he was otherwise enraged. Um, <laughs> but I thought if you would bear with me, I just to give voice, to speak for Dan Quayle so he feels heard, I brought with me a few um, of his most, I think, wisest statements. Could I share those with you tonight? Oh, please, that yes. Be? Okay. 
this is good. Um, this is, uh, yeah, I, I called these after a lot of very punishing research. Okay, this is the complete knowledge of Dan Quayle. It won't take long. Um, unabridged, <laughs> unabridged. Dan Quayle on education. Quite frankly, teachers are the only profession that teach our children. <laughs> Ferris Bueller's Day Off is my favorite movie because it reminds me of my time in school. <laughs> you take the United Negro College Fund model that what a waste it is to lose one's mind <laughs> or not to have a mind is being very wasteful. How true that is. <laughs> Dan Quayle on geography. We have a firm commitment to Europe. We are a part of Europe. <laughs> I love California. I practically grew up in Phoenix. It's wonderful to be here in the great state of Chicago. <laughs> Dan Quayle on outer space. Space is almost infinite. As a matter of fact, we think it is infinite. For NASA, space is still a high priority. It's time for the human race to enter the solar system. <laughs> Dan Quayle on the vice presidency. One word sums up probably the responsibility of any vice president, and that one word is to be prepared. <laughs> Dan Quayle, master detective. <laughs> when I have been asked during these last weeks who caused the riots and the killing in LA, my answer has been direct and simple. Who is to blame for the riots? The rioters are to blame. <laughs> who is to blame for the killings? The killers are to blame. Hard to argue. Hard to argue with Hard that. Argue. We're almost done. <laughs> Dan Quayle, time traveler. I have made good judgments in the past. I have made good judgments in the future. You should have been on Doctor Who. I love that. That's great. The future will be better tomorrow. Again. <laughs> The real question for 1988 is whether we're going to go forward to tomorrow or past to the, to the back. <laughs> and finally, Dan Quill on family values. Illegitimacy is something we should talk about in terms of not having it. And last but not least, Republicans understand the importance of bondage between parent and child. <laughs> there we go. Dan Quayle. Dan Quayle, ladies and gentlemen. That's it. The, the man who read all those statements, which are all true. They're all real. Yeah. Is the same man who Mike Pence, the vice president, went to for counsel. Yeah. To find out whether or not he actually had to make sure that the legitimate election that Joe Biden won was won by Joe Biden. Right. Now, they have a lot in common because they're both uh, incredibly sexy, first of all. <laughs> but they're both um, say. from Indiana. Yeah. Um, they were both vice presidents. And so, you know, M Mike Pence, as we all know, was under a lot of pressure from Trump to magically elect Trump. I mean, there's, I still don't really understand 
this is only the idea that somebody who really didn't pay attention in school would come up with. Like, <laughs> you know, Donald Trump just says, you can do it. You know, <laughs> of course you can do it. Like, did he read the Constitution? No. I no. mean, he tried to steal the Constitution and take it with him to Mar-a-Lago, but he didn't actually read the document. <laughs> so he said, he said, you know, he wanted, um, he wanted Pence to, to you know, uh, not certify the votes. And so he called Dan Quayle, and it's this really eerie moment in our history where Dan Quayle becomes the voice of reason <laughs> in the Republican Party. And he, he actually talked do him down. He says, you can't do it. He said, talk to the parliamentarian. I cannot picture him saying the word parliamentarian. <laughs> right. But right. somehow, I mean, I don't really know what to make of this. Did Dan Quayle improve with age, or did just everything around him go to <laughs> And I think it's probably more the latter. It's that whole thing like, you know, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Right, no offense right. to the blind or the one-eyed man. One man yeah. um, but um, no, I do think that I, I, that was an amazing moment that Dan Quayle actually kind of redeemed himself. You know, he didn't, fortunately when he was vice president, he never played much of a role. Like he was always, you know, he, you know George H.W. Bush didn't, you know, didn't die in office or nothing happened, so he, like, Dan Quayle didn't have to invoke that magic role. word to yeah. be prepared at any point. <laughs> um, I mean, the worst thing he did, I guess, I guess the biggest fight he ever got into was with a fictitious sitcom character, Murphy Brown. And oh, he, that's true. And he lost that. So. I thought you were going to say the, the uh, elementary school kid who told uh, you have to add an E to the end of potato. Because, right. of course, that was his other uh, wonderful That was the other thing. Stage. If you Google, uh, sadly, if you Google um, Dan Quayle, the most common Google search is Dan Quayle potato, oh, spelled God. correctly. But it's astonishing for those of us who are not in comedy like you are, who work in news, to have had to, to sit there and listen to, because at the time, people were saying, well, Mike Pence really showed integrity. Mike Pence really stood up and did his job. The fact that he had to go to Dan Quayle right. and ask whether or not he really had to certify the election is astonishing to me. How do you not know that as a vice president of the United States and then to ask for counsel, the one you just read all those statements from. Well, no, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right, Mitch. And also, the whole, this is one thing that sort of bothers me about the way our news currently is reported, which is that somebody will get kind of a conventional wisdom, like Mike Pence was a hero that day. And, and then that's repeated very um, uncritically. Like, you'll just see that all over the place, where people will say, well, give him credit. He was good on January 6th. He was not good on January 6th. What he did is he called Dan Quayle, and he was begging for Dan Quayle to give him, to, for any shred, any, any hint that it would be OK to do it. Like, he wasn't saying, um, he wasn't saying like, I know this is the wrong thing to do. How am I going to break it to, to right. Trump or something like that? He was just saying, like, you don't know how much pressure I'm under, yeah. you know? And uh, so, yeah. It, you know. Dan, you know, Mike Pence is, is a tool. And uh, he's a tool that also, even Republicans don't like him. So I mean, it sort of sounds like he is now sort of man without a country. You know, he just has, it's pretty much just him and mother all alone. <laughs> all alone. Um, and that's it. It's sad. Let's, let's jump ahead to the stage of acceptance. Acceptance. Now, now at, to review, yeah. students, uh, <laughs> this is like Schoolhouse Rock. Here. So, the ridicule stage is when dumb politicians had to pretend to be smart. Right. The acceptance phase is when politicians learned that, that being ignorant wasn't so bad. They could own their ignorance. They could accept their ignorance. And they'd be seen as like a normal guy, you know, an, an a, authentic, approachable person that you'd want to have a beer with. That's always the thing. Yeah. Would I want to have a beer with this person? Well, then they should be president. And you know what I learned in, in doing research for the book? You know, you think like that, do you want to have a beer question? OK, everybody assumes, OK, that was something like some Gallup poll or Harris poll came up with that. Do you know what came up with the beer poll? That was um, the Sam Adams Brewing Company. It was, just a, it was not a scientific poll. It was just a marketing gimmick. And they were saying, who would you rather, and it started in 2000, was who would you rather have a beer with, Al Gore or George W. Bush? And naturally, everybody chose the recovering alcoholic, <laughs> George W. Bush, because that makes sense. Um, that makes sense. He was a good choice. One of the that. fascinating examples you give about George W. Bush is that he, believe it or not, actually learned something. Because I didn't realize that he ran for Congress mm -hmm. uh, back in 1978. Right. And at the time, he was trying to do the ridicule stage, where he wanted to pretend to look smart. Mm -hmm. so he would tout his 
credentials of going to an Ivy League That's school. That's right. I'm so smart. Both Two Ivy League schools. Two of them, right, yeah. not just one. I mean, you know. And then in Texas, they said, uh, yeah, that's not going to fly here, and he was defeated. And from that moment on, he said, well, I'm just a good old Texan boy. Absolutely. He was running against a guy, a Democrat in that congressional district, uh, named um, Ken Hans. And Ken Hans did these withering radio ads to attack George W. Bush, and it's like, George W. Bush went to Yale College. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then he went to Harvard Business School. And it was basically like saying, you know, uh, you know, he is like, you know, he cooked meth. You know, it was like, it was the worst thing he could say. Actually, no, I want the guy who cooked meth. I don't want that Harvard guy. Um, so when he ran against Al Gore, he basically played the role of Ken Hans. He was like, you know, I might not, I might not know very much, but neither do you. You know, and it was like everyone's, yeah, I like that guy. Yeah. I don't like that Al Gore guy. He reads books, <laughs> and it really worked. It was like it was this complete. He flipped the script, yeah. and sort of the pivotal moment was actually it was a New England story because he was interviewed early in his campaign, George W. Bush, by this radio host in Boston. I guess TV. I guess TV host. Andy and, Miller. Yeah, Andy yes. Hiller. Okay, yep. And Andy Hiller, his whole shtick in those days was he liked to ambush politicians. Right. So he would give them like a pop quiz. And he gave George W. Bush this pop quiz where he asked him to name the four leaders of four different pretty important store, um, uh, countries in the news at that time, like Pakistan and places like that. And George W. Bush got three out of four wrong. He didn't know three out of four of these. And that in, in the olden days, like you know, in the 70s, like when Gerald Ford was running for re-election, he would make a gaffe about Soviet domination of Eastern Europe and stuff like that. Though we were back in the ridicule stage where if you seem dumb, it really hurt you. hurt you. Yeah. But with George W. Bush, this was really where they flipped the script because he had a really um, smart um, communications uh, person named Karen Hughes, and she after this complete train wreck of an interview where he got three out of four questions wrong, she came out and she said, George W. Bush is running for president of the United States, not Jeopardy contestant. <laughs> and that was really interesting because it was like saying, actually, knowledge is not important. And, and it's, so he you know, came into the White House really after kind of leading with ignorance. I mean, with Reagan, Reagan and his handlers tried to hide his ignorance, but he was fine. He just thought it made him very approachable and more likable. And you know, the only problem was, you know, we invaded this country, Iraq, that he did not have even rudimentary understanding of. Like a few weeks before we invaded, he had a meeting with some Iraqis in the Oval Office, and they were talking about the Sunnis and the Shiites. And this was the first that George W. Bush had heard of these people. And his reaction was, I thought the Iraqis were Muslims. <laughs> Funny, not funny. <laughs> so that was, you know, yeah. that was who we wound up with, and, and that was the danger. And again, like it started with George W. Bush, he was sort of the likable face of acceptance. It was okay to be ignorant. It was like made me a normal guy, I'm not like a nerd like Al Gore. But then the person who really picked up that baton was Sarah Palin, because oh, Sarah start? Palin had, I'm just a hockey mom, and um, she really, the, I have a catalog of all the things that she didn't know, but um, it's, it's probably too, I've already ruined your evening. Right. <laughs> so buy the book and pour yourself a stiff drink and read, the, very, read, the, Sarah stiff Palin, drink. read the Sarah Palin part. Yeah, because it, it gets worse. And it does, <laughs> it does. Uh, there's a moment you chronicle where uh, she was pranked by a, for some reason, a, a Quebec radio uh, yeah. duo, a team that was- a Comedy duo, yeah. They, they, they put on the heavy French accents and they, yeah started asking her if she knew this prime minister uh, of Quebec, and all the names were fake, and the, you know, but she didn't know she was being pranked. Right. And she went with it. She just let him just go on. Well, the guy, the guy claimed to be not just any French person, he claimed to be the, the president of France. <laughs> and they, and nobody in her advance team, none of her staff even knew the name of the president of France, so they were saying, how do you spell that? And they were writing it down, and so they, they at first didn't think there was any way that Sarah Palin would pick up the phone. But they got her on the phone <laughs> and they were saying ridiculous things like they saying, so you say you can see Russia from your house. I can see Belgium, which is not quite so interesting. No. 
And she, her response is like, well, yeah, we all have neighbors who've got to work together with. You know, she, just, she just was like rolling with it. And the, I actually felt bad for these comedians because they thought for sure within about a minute she'd figure out yeah. she was being pregnant. She did not have a clue. After about nine minutes, they ran out of material. <laughs> and they just finally had to say, well, Governor Palin, this is who we are. And she was like, oh, this is too bad. You know, she was like really disappointed. Yeah, disappointed with it. It was sad. Later, of course, she ends up on uh, The Masked Singer, right? She's revealed yeah. to be one of those. Yeah. There's no problems with that. No. Again, this is a person who was a heartbeat away from the White House, or could have been. She could have been. She could have been. I mean, she, you know, I will say one encouraging thing. I actually, you know, I don't find much encouragement in Mike Pence being the hero of January 6th, mm. but Sarah Palin actually, and this may seem a little counterintuitive, but she actually fills me with tremendous hope right now. And the reason why I say that was because last year during the midterms, she ran for the open seat, congressional seat in Alaska that had been a traditionally Republican seat. And then since that was a special election, she got to run again a few months later when they were um, trying to fill the seat for the, the entire term. So there, she had the opportunity to lose an, two elections in about three months, and she nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> Lost them all. And that's why, like, I, the book sounds like you said it gets worse and worse, and it does, except that I do believe in something, and maybe this is the Midwestern optimist in me, but I do believe in something called the breaking system of democracy. And what that means is that when it really looks like we've elected total morons and we're hurtling off a cliff, we actually do pump the brakes and keep that from happening. And the midterm elections were a great indicator that the braking system, even though we're like terrified about the state of our democracy, the braking system worked. They defeated um, Sarah Palin twice. They defeated Dr. Oz, Herschel Walker. Herschel Walker, who by the way, had much the same opinion of trees that Ronald Reagan did. <laughs> That's right. I mean, people Not were apparent. giving Herschel Walker such shit and saying he's such a moron. He said trees are bad. And I was like, this dude is Reagan-esque. <laughs> he's like, says he's that, he, it was really almost bad. like reading from the Reagan prayer book. But I guess what I'm saying is that, you know, if you go through the list of all the people, there were all of these Secretary of State candidates who were election deniers and were basically saying, like, elect me and I won't count the votes. And interestingly enough, people who vote like their votes to be counted. And Believe so it or not. All, pretty much all of those people were defeated. All those kind of clown candidates were defeated. And the breaking system kind of worked. So I guess my sort of cause for optimism, if you can call it that, is that elections may be very close. And it's certainly we've had some terrible, terrible people elected over the last 60 years. But there does seem to be not overwhelming common sense, but enough common sense to win close elections, which just means nobody who has common sense has any excuse for not voting. That's as simple as it is. There, there is that. There is that. Yeah. And the last, uh, the last chapter of the book really is about what we all can do, mm -hmm. you know, to, to keep the breaking system working. Right. Um, you know, but you also say, you point out to yourself, you say, you call yourself out of the book. You say, I no, do. I'm part of the problem. I say I'm an you know, really? well, I wasn't going to say it, Andy. This is, we're all friends here. You know? I know. No, it, you, you make the point that we all are part of the problem. Not everybody in this room, we're all perfect. We know that. No. But, you know, we have a responsibility to do more than just post something on social media. When right. you're angry at somebody, to, to, to lash out on Twitter, it can't be just that. It has to be more than that if this breaking system is going to work because there's still a lot of tension about what's going to happen next year. Well, as well, there should be. But, you know, one thing to keep in mind is, like, people really freak out because, you know, they go on, first of all, nobody should go on social media, period, except to find out where I'm doing a show. And then <laughs> find out where I am and then log off. Okay, that's what I recommend. But I read this really great book that sort of informed that last chapter called um, Politics is for Power, and it's by this political scientist named Eitan Hirsch. And he... He developed a great phrase, which I um, quote, which is he referred to political hobbyism. And what he, what he means by that is people who think they're politically active because they watch MSNBC a lot. And you know, they watch Rachel Maddow, and they think, OK, I'm, I'm really plugged in. And it's like, no, actually, you're not. You're being a spectator. You know, you're watching people. And it's great to feel like, you know, I know people like what I do to the extent they do, because like they agree with what I say, and that's reassuring. And people like Rachel Maddow because 
they agree with what she's saying, but it, th that's not being active in politics. That's being a participant. And if like you hear what I say and you laugh and then you go to bed and say, oh, I feel so much better now, and then you don't do anything, then I have failed in my job. <laughs> because I do want to scare you at least a little bit because I don't want, I, I really feel there's some value in recognizing that we all have a job to do. And um, you know, watching MSNBC, it really isn't that much different from watching Fox if you're on the right wing. I think MSNBC is Fox for vegans. You know, it's, <laughs> it's a little bit more accurate, but not always. But um, OK, so get your information. You know, it's good to be informed, but then what are you going to do with your information? So it's like, can you help register people to vote? Can you make sure that if your neighbor maybe has some ambulatory problems that you get him or her to the polling place? Do you contribute to various um, political campaigns um, you know, within reason? I mean, I think sometimes we like click on those banner ads and it's like you know, we, we've dumped like millions of dollars into campaigns that you'll never win, but it just makes us feel good. So do your research and make sure your dollars are spent wisely. Um, but in, and also, I think the most important thing, and this is something that I think we all can do, and even though it goes against my grain because it, it's something that I think I'm very bad at, um, get involved in local community affairs because that's actually, yeah, right? Like, you're being here tonight. Actually, supporting Bookstock is, believe it or not, you are casting a vote for literacy. You're saying books are important. You're saying libraries are important. We shouldn't ban books. Those are all political statements. Um, this event isn't costing you anything, but there are <laughs> probably other things you can do like contributing to Bookstock that will be valuable. Um, and you know, it's funny, like you think about people watch the news and they watch cable news and they nationalize all of our problems. They think it's all about like Kevin McCarthy and Mitch McConnell and those bastards in Washington. But actually, they might not even bother to vote in their local town election. <laughs> Or for and, school board. Or for school like board, yeah. which, as you know, has become another hotbed. And the sure. thing is, like, I sense that there might be some left-wing people in the audience here tonight. <laughs> the right wing figured this out a long time ago. Yeah. They're much better organized. They're much less passive. Um, they, you know, if you really want to read a scary book, you read Jane Mayer's book, Dark Money, which is all about how the Koch uh, brothers Koch have, brothers, yeah. you know, they talk about, like, George Soros is, like, controls the world and everything. I wish George Soros controlled the world as much as the Koch brothers do. Well, they're like playing the, Koch, the long game. Yeah, you know, exactly. Thing. It's not all about what, what they're getting out of this tomorrow. It's like, we're going to set up the federal society, and then eventually we're going to have all these judges that go fishing with us in Alaska. You know, it's like they really do play the long game. And I'm you know, speaking from people who are either center or left of center, like we have to get better at that. But it's like you just, just by being a hobbyist isn't going to get it done. Can I ask you this, though? Because I really think I, do, and I, I, I think this is a really important point, though, because you just said, you know, looking out at this wonderful audience here, we're, we're probably guessing left to left of center. Mm -hmm. You mentioned in the book that, you know, you've got to get involved because maybe you can change one person's mind. Mm -hmm. The difficulty I see is that when you read statistics that up to 70 percent of Republicans still believe the election was stolen from Trump, mm -hmm. they're not going to be listening to you and I tonight. They're not going to be watching MSNBC, nor, not saying they should. But when a fact is put in front of someone and someone denies that fact, and we know that Biden won the election. The hand counts were done in every single state was contested. It's a fact. Biden won. If you can't tell somebody that this apple is an apple and it's not a rock, if they think it's a rock, how do you get that person to not pick up the rock and take a bite? Well, two things about that. And boy, we're getting very serious now, but I like it. Sorry, you're I the like funny it. guy. You're the funny guy. No, but guy. I like I'm it. Not... Well, I've been, one of my deep dives I've been doing lately is, is I've been really ob obsessed with Watergate, which is like, we're, this is the 50th anniversary of the Watergate hearings. And Vermont's own um, Gerald Graff wrote this great book last year called Watergate, A New History. And I read it's like 850 pages about Watergate. It's like a Russian novel. There are so many characters, and it's hard to keep straight. Yeah. But what was interesting is like people forget like Watergate when it first happened, the reactions to it were very much on partisan lines. Mm. Almost all Republicans were behind the president. It took a while. Now I do think that one of the differences then is we didn't have a Fox News, we didn't have the internet, right. we didn't have all these alternate channels of, of misinformation. So 
it was easier like once they played a tape where they showed that Nixon was doing what he was doing, it was like game over. Nowadays, like, you know, you know, the there's really hard to envision a tape that would convince some Republicans of anything, you know. So that is a problem. But here's a second, the second point I want to make, which is that let's just try to imagine this because it's true. It's like this country pretty much has always been divided down the line about 50-50. Like in 1932, when we were like totally smacked by the Great Depression, there was still about 40% of the voters who thought, yeah, let's reelect Herbert Hoover. <laughs> like, he's right. doing an awesome job. We forget that. And I think when you get in social media and you see all these people saying, like, Trump 2024 and, like, trying to rile you and everything, um, just keep in mind, you don't have to convince everybody to change their mind. You don't have to convince more than really a few thousand people in a few key states to change their minds to win an election. So it's like if you get obsessed with the fact that there's so many people out there whose opinions are so alien and, alien and so off-putting to you, you're kind of missing the point. We live in a democracy. We don't need, we've never had an election where like 90% of the people have been in agreement. Right. It's always been pretty much down the middle. And it's, and it's all, there, you know, a landslide like one of the Ronald Reagan landslides, it's like about, I don't know, 56%, something like that. It's never like 80%. So, we need to sort of stop worrying about the fact that there's so many people who love Donald Trump. Let them do that. Just make sure you've got a few thousand more people who don't. In and certain then you states, win. though. In certain I, states. I, I really hate to keep bringing this down, but you no. know, we wouldn't have to worry about this if we had a national popular vote. I agree. You, you know. I, but I thought you were going to handle that for me. <laughs> I'm working I thought, on I thought I'm you could. I think it, no, absolutely. That the electoral colleges. That's another just absurdity of our politics. It's, it's bogus. At least it gets people to pay attention to your state of Ohio. Not really, because Ohio's a red state. Oh, now it's like dead. I know. It's, it's Ohio is, I mean, completely. Ohio, I was like back visiting last year during the Republican primary, and there was just this blizzard of ads for Republican senatorial candidate, each one more insane than the last. I mean, it was like J.D. Vance, believe it or not, was not the craziest person who ran for Senate there. <laughs> There was this one guy who, I got, I can't remember his name now, but I can Google it later, but his, his slogan was, whatever his name was, I can't remember, he said like, pro-gun, pro-God, pro-Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, so yeah. Like, he was like you know, the alternative J.D. Vance, so J.D. Vance seemed like a pre, like, you know, I don't know. So I, I, we like shouldn't Abraham worry about Kid Rock shooting Bud Light cans. Like, that's not, that's a distraction. Has he done that recently? <laughs> yeah, he bought a bunch of Bud Light cans and shot them all up. He was angry about something. That's political activism <laughs> at its finest. <laughs> that is going to really move the dial. That's good. I don't want to have a beer with Kid Rock if he's going to shoot my <laughs> beer can. Yeah, I mean, he just spent all this money on a can of Bud Light, and now it's That's just great. leaking all over your shirt. Yeah. It's no good. And actually, he's supporting Bud Light because he had to buy the Bud Light to That's shoot exactly the can. exactly right. Yes. Yeah, so. I've never quite understood that. I'm, I'm spending all this money on the beer that I'm then going to destroy. You know what? I've decided he should not be our president. Because <laughs> yeah. you convinced me. Okay. Convince I was me. thinking he was going to be somebody's running mate, but we, we actually don't know for sure. Hey, should we take some questions? I think These we should, people, yeah. Do, do we have, have any, time? I'm sorry. Do we, we have any know. questions? I think we, do we have a We've microphone? got a handheld mic, I think. Um, yeah, you can, this gentleman down here is. You're right there, I think. Okay, we have um, about 10 minutes for Q&A, and um, if you have a question, raise your hand, wait for the microphone to come to you, and stand, and please state your name. Oh, and also one just one little pro tip. Please make sure that your question is a question. <laughs> Questions, generally speaking, um, end in a question mark. Sometimes your voice will go up at the end of a question. Like, uh? if it's if it's a statement, that probably won't be good. And don't do one of those statements and then at the end of it say, "Don't you agree?" Because that's not a question. <laughs> That's an excellent point. Yeah. Okay. okay. Let's hear. Okay. <laughs> You're on. Thank you. My name is John Riley. I read today that Apple, the company, is suing the apple growers in Switzerland. And apparently, this is not the first country where they've done this, but for trademark infringement. Now, um, Apple, as a company, I believe started in 1980, and Apple, the product, we can trace back at a minimum to Adam and Eve. Which would argue. Okay, this is sounding a lot like a statement. No, but no. 
and I've got to say, it's also sounding vaguely like a TED talk at this point. So <laughs> let's get to that part where you go, oh, uh, just, at the end. I was just saying, I seem to give the growers first mover advantage, but what's your opinion on the relative merits of this uh, legal claim? <laughs> I'm glad you're handling this one, Andy. I, I find that story very hard to believe. <laughs> oh, come on, you're that, full of these Is stories. that a really, is that a true story? Is that something that you made up to? No, I read it. You read it? Where, what was your news source, sir? Well, there's, there's precedent. I mean, the Jack Daniels company just settled a lawsuit because there was a, a dog toy that had the similar image, and uh, they, were, they were sued, and they actually won because you don't want to confuse the dog product with the, the whiskey. I see. So. I don't really, you know, I really am... Um, Wired.com. Wired, okay, that's a real website. Condé Nast is part of the Condé Nast family, like the New Yorker, NewYorker.com. <laughs> little product placement there. Um, well, let me tell you something. I know that I build this performance tonight as a night of trademark infringement discussion. <laughs> but I think, I think, in fairness, we've been talking a lot about trademark infringement <laughs> all night, and I'd like to move on to some other issues. Thank you. But thank, thank you. Well, I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be doing a webinar on this issue later, which I hope you'll log on to. It's for people in the industry. It's I think it's a thousand dollars. But please join me. These are challenging um, questions. It is. That's a tough one. If, Try it, by the way, try to make the questions easier. Like, pretend, okay. pretend you're talking to Kevin McCarthy. <laughs> okay, sir. So, um, have you ever, would you consider writing about school boards, because there's at least 60 years of crazy, and it's getting worse? Would I ever um, consider writing about school boards? Um, you know, that is, it is a very rich topic, actually. I mean, I think, um, I've never considered doing it in the, in the past. Um, but I'm afraid that since you brought it up, if I write about school boards, I will be infringing on your trademark. <laughs> so I, I, I think to avoid litigation, I will not. But thanks for, thanks for bringing it up. I hope you will write about it. But I would register that trademark very soon, because there are some people here I see writing down school board idea. Good. OK. Next, next question. Next. So far, I'm nailing these answers. You are. You're, you're doing very well. I'm really being informative. Okay, here's somebody. Hi. Hi. My how name's are you? Mary. Good. Very nice to hear you. Um, I'm just curious. You mentioned your job of being a political satirist, and how did that come to be? Oh, that's a good question. Well, I am. Um, you know, I actually started writing fake news in high school. I, I worked, I was the editor of my high school newspaper um, in Shaker Heights, Ohio, called the Shakerite. No, really? Yes. Oh, the great, great clever name. name. Love that. Yeah. Very clever. And I was, I was editor of the paper, even though I had absolutely no interest in journalism. I would just sort of wait out the whole year because we would eventually do an April Fool's issue. <laughs> and the April Fool's issue was nothing but fake news, and I loved that. And then. I went to college, I went to, um, I went to Harvard, much like um, Ron DeSantis, and, uh, and I, I was the editor of the Harvard Lampoon, and there we would also do a fake, a fake news thing. What would happen is the, the Harvard newspaper, which was called The Crimson, which was this very serious, pretty solidly left-wing paper. They were very woke before, before woke before was that called was woke. Word, yeah. and, um, and, there, and on days when they would not publish, there were a few days, holidays every year where they wouldn't publish, we would write a fake crimson and get it printed up to look exactly like the crimson and then deposit it on all the kids' steps. <laughs> and it would take them a little while to figure out that it was actually not a real crimson. Uh, and um, so I was doing it then. And then around 2000, when I saw, sort of saw, discovered the internet and how much fun it was, I started writing these Borowitz reports to friends, and I would just start sort of emailing them out to friends, and then eventually Newsweek for a while was publishing them, and then eventually The New Yorker decided that they wanted to own it kind of and, and do it exclusively. And so really it started like back in high school, and it's continued this amount of time. So I guess what I'm saying is there's been no growth, <laughs> like no maturity at all, like I've just stayed stuck 
um, in, in what I would say a fairly serious rut. Um, so that's, that's how, but I think, you know, what I like about it, interestingly enough, I'm interested in politics, but that's not really what drives me to do it. What I like about it is that politics just throws off so many great characters. And that's the main thing. It's like there's this group of characters. It's like a sitcom that we've all watched. We all know who all they are. There's the dumb one, you know. Like on Cheers, like, you know, Woody was Woody, the dumb yeah, one. Yeah. Here in politics, it's like, they're all Woody. <laughs> they're all pretty dumb. But it's like, you know, they all have characteristics that we're really familiar with, so we can play with that, and there's a sort of shared shared um, laugh to that. But you know, so. you mentioned Ron DeSantis, and now I'm thinking also about uh, people like Elise Stefanik, who is Harvard, you know, uh, yes. from here, Harvard again. Yeah. These, these folks are smart, but they're yeah. pretending not to be on right. purpose. That's the celebration phase. Yeah. That's where, so we, you know, to review, we've gone from <laughs> smart people pretending to be dumb in the ridicule phase. Uh, I mean, dumb people pretending to be smart, um, dumb people accepting their dumbness. And now we're in celebration where even smart, super well-educated politicians have to pretend to be dumb for votes. Like, Elise Stefanik was like a perfectly credible sort of conservative Republican. She, when Trump was running for election in 2016, she said some very scathing things about his statements about NATO and stuff like that. And then once he was elected, her tremendous zest for opportunism became very apparent. She just really went for it and started saying things like a blithering idiot. And that she also decided that she would sponsor um, the, the candidacy of a very bright young New York Republican <laughs> named George Santos. She was his number one fundraiser. Is that true? That is true. Uh, um, and uh, so, you know, this is the problem with what I call performative ignorance, which is like people like DeSantis, you know, DeSantis who went to Harvard and Yale, Ted Cruz, Harvard and Princeton. Right. Ted Cruz who thinks that Mr. Potato Head's gender is the biggest threat to America right now. <laughs> well, he'll say so. Yeah, when we all know it's the Disney films oh, it's that's the causing the problems. Oh, scary but, so, you know, you have these people saying intentionally stupid things. The problem, is, and it happened in the case of Elise Stefanik, there's a point at which performative stupidity becomes indistinguishable from the real thing. And it's like she supported George Santos, and now she's like stuck with George Santos, who's now been indicted a bunch of times. So it's, um, you know, it's a real, uh, you know, it, it, it's a problem. It's a problem that we have, like, we're now in a, in a phase where ignorance is preferable to expertise. But again, to get back to some encouraging news, the midterms showed that voters didn't really go for that. They, you know, they had a lot of, they had a chance to vote for Dr. Oz, who says that there's something called ukaluba root extract that helps you lose weight. <laughs> and uh, they didn't go for that. And, they did not. And, and they didn't, you know, vote for Herschel Walker, who, you know, paid for an abortion and then gave his girlfriend a get well card, <laughs> <laughs> which could be incriminating. He did have some deep thoughts about vampires and werewolves. I he did. He, yeah, he, he, he said that, correctly. what did he say, the werewolves, he'd rather be a werewolf than a vampire because a werewolf can kill a vampire. Right, right. right. You know I one mean, thing he won't be? To be a fair, senator. he's not wrong uh, about that. Yeah, he, <laughs> well, at least not. That's one thing he will not be. I didn't mean to interrupt the questioning. I'm sorry. Is there, is there another question? <laughs> yeah, is there, we have a, I think we have five more minutes, let's say. Yes, way in the back. He needs a mic. The first question is, where is Where's my mic? Where's my mic? mic? <laughs> <laughs> Quick show of hands before the question. How many people here have been to a school board meeting at their local school ever? Oh, hey, that's pretty good. That's very good. That's great. OK, that's was it contentious? Good. No? OK. Uh, my name is uh, Steve Shem. I live in Woodstock. And I realize that when you tell a joke, we laugh. But when you are satirical, we learn. What do you think about that? <laughs> I, I think he was skirting your rule a little bit there. <laughs> I discern a statement. Um, wait, I'm not even sure I understood what you asked. No, what you said when you when I tell a joke, you laugh. You but laugh, but when I when you're sat satirical, you learn something. You, you learn, learn something, something from the satire. What, what, what do you think of that? Making us making a joke. It's teaching us something. It's teaching us something. Right. Well, tonight, if I had one thing that I was trying to teach people. And it seems like a small thing, but it's, it's really hard to understand. It's what is the difference between a question and a statement? <laughs> um, now, 
if I were to say, for example, be nice to our non-paying audience. I know. You please. You know what? Next time they'll pay, and I'll be a little nicer to you. But as long as you're gonna walk in here, freeloaders, you're gonna have to take what I give you. Um, so. I would say the difference between a question and a statement is that <laughs> when I ask a question, you laugh, but when I make a statement, you learn. So that would be, that, that's, that would be the answer. I hope I've helped in some, in some small This way. will be the last question. Okay, who's going to get it? Who's going to get it? One over here. Peter Roman. Over here, let's give yeah. it to her. Now, I'm... before you, yeah, give her the microphone. Um, give it, give her the microphone, <laughs> hand it over. She's, no, right He's here. the chairman of the board. <laughs> oh. oh, you, oh wait. I'm pulling rank here. Oh wait, so we're playing, we're, we're right. playing favorites. Yeah. <laughs> now this woman's. T this two more questions. Maybe we have yes, two, two, two more, more questions. We'll give it to the we'll chairman of the board. Quick. But I want to say something. I think make, giving the chairman of the board the last question yes. goes against everything I stand for. <laughs> <laughs> and when I was told that I was going to do book stock, I was told two things. I was told I get paid $80,000 <laughs> and that the chairman of the board would not have the last question. <laughs> Both of those were lies. <laughs> I've gotten paid nothing. There wasn't even Evian downstairs in the green room. <laughs> there was a machine that said ice on it. It didn't even produce ice. <laughs> And so we're giving you the question, then we will give it to the chairman of the board. <laughs> um, but I'm going to treat your question as the official last question. <laughs> and the chairman of the board's question is going to be considered bonus content. Okay? <laughs> so since you have the last question, official question, I ask you one favor. Try to make this a question <laughs> so that much sums pressure. up the whole evening. And when I say that, I would love you to tie the threads of our conversation <laughs> together like a beautiful tapestry so that each member of the audience leaves here tonight thinking about themselves and the world in an entirely new way. They might see colors differently. They might look at the person they came with and say, I don't want to be with you anymore. What is this life? I want a different life. So proceed. Christine. That's a big ask, <laughs> um, but I'll do my best. Okay. In honor of the fact that we're at Bookstock, um, I was wondering what are some lesser known uh, writers or books that have had a big influence on you and uh, your career? That's a great hey. question. You nailed it. You have a winner. You nailed it. Well, um, I, I have some favorite books that Sometimes, some of them are books I read a long time ago that I've reread and are still very funny. And I think it's really hard to write a funny novel. I wish I could do that, but it's like, it's, I think that's a kind of genius. Um, Scoop by Evelyn Waugh is still like the best satire of the news. And like a lot of his, he was started as a journalist and a lot of his observations still hold up. I think that's a great book, Scoop. I think um, Lucky Jim by Kingsley Amos is a great satire of academia. Um, that still is tremendously funny. A more recent book on that same theme was written by a woman named Julie Shoemaker called Dear Committee Members, which I really recommend um, very, very strongly. But I mean, I'm just, you know, I, I, do, I do read quite a bit. I mean, of recent books that I've read, I do think that the Watergate book, Watergate A New History, it's not like one of those influential books I've ever read, but it's like, it was really fascinating. Was it, you wouldn't think like an 800-page book about Watergate could hold your interest, but it was a real page turner. It was really wonderful. Um, but uh, those are some, those are some of my, um, high, some of my high points. I like um, some great short story writers, you know, Alice Munro, Lily King. Mm. Um, they're just Anne Patchett. Anything by Anne Patchett is great. Bel Canto is a great novel by her. Commonwealth. Um, so yeah, they're all, probably you can get them all at the Yankee Bookshop. <laughs> there you go. Um, okay, where's the chairman of the board? The chairman. Chairman. Here we go. Uh, my name's Peter Romanero. I'm from Woodstock, 
And I was an alumnus, a uh, member of the Lampoon, and I, was on, I sold ads, so that tells you how stupid I am. Okay. <laughs> uh, I want to ask both Mitch and Andy, uh, are there genuinely funny politicians? Okay. Who is the funniest politicians you guys have run into? Intentionally funny or unintentionally no, funny? I think he means intentionally. Why, do you want to go first? Do you have because you've interviewed probably a lot of people coming through for like the New Hampshire primary and stuff like that. Have they ever yeah. tried to be funny and succeeded? You know, I I tried to be funny once when I interviewed. <laughs> this was a mistake on my part, and this was the first radio job I ever had. It was on WNBY and Martha's Vineyard. Oh. Okay. And who showed up in the summer but Bill and Hillary Clinton? <laughs> 1994, and uh, I was sent to the airport when they, they did their vacation there, and they were going to leave, and I was told, well, you're going to record a statement by them. They want to thank the people of the vineyard. I said, that's fine. I bought my recording equipment, and I got there, and this is 1994. It's amazing how much times have changed. I don't remember, first of all, being whisked into a room and patted down by the Secret Service. Nobody paid any attention to me whatsoever, and I was sitting as far from them as you and I are now. Wow. So... Uh, I got there and I set up my recording equipment and I put the mic in front and I thought, okay, make your statement. And they said, well, he didn't prepare a statement. Big surprise. Uh, why don't you just ask them a couple of questions? And I had no preparation for this whatsoever. This is my first radio job. I'm not really a seasoned journalist yet. So I said things like, did you have a lot of fun on your vacation? <laughs> did you go canoeing? You know, things like that. <laughs> And uh, then eventually I tried, to, I tried to tell a joke. I said, do you ever think that Bob Dole needs a vacation? And he, Clinton, Bill Clinton just looked at me, saw it, like stared at me right there, thought I was trying to get a rise out of him. Hillary cracked up. She thought it was hilarious. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's as funny as I ever got with a politician. But I would say that the, the funniest politician that, that I've really <laughs> ever seen, would again, it's unintentional, but it would have to be Dan Quayle because it was, it was that that glassy-eyed look, right. you know, that moment when Lloyd Benson said that line to him uh, during the debates that I knew John Kennedy, yeah, you know, yeah. you're no John Kennedy, and you could actually see his Adam's apple go up and down. Right. That's, right. that's like right out of Monty Python. So right. I, I thought that was, I thought that was kind of hilarious. Well, how about you? Well, I mean, Quail, obviously, because I've read some of his greatest hits. He's, I mean, he is, I think, in the category of unintentionally hilarious. Yes, I would. I, he's very high, but. You know, there have been like a couple of politicians who have been genuinely funny. Um, and one guy who I actually have done a couple of shows with who really is funny is Adam Schiff. Adam Schiff, is that right? he's done stand up, believe it or not. No. And, um, I'm shocked. And that. he, but the other thing that Adam Schiff really has going for him, which is that something I do not have going for me, is that when you come to a show, you know, and it's a comedian, like everybody expects you to be. Funny, so like, there's no kind of surprise value. But Adam Schiff is so dignified, and he's a member of Congress, and so when he says something funny, it's it's like the line automatically becomes much funnier because you don't expect it coming out of him. So I I did a show with him in 2018 um, when he was um, on he was on the Judiciary Committee with. Um, the late lamented Devin Nunez, you remember <laughs> Devin Nunez? Oh my. And I said, um, and I said to him, um, and this is at the New Yorker Festival, so it's like he's a pretty serious venue, and, yeah. um, and I said to him, so you work with um, Devin Nunez, what, what must that be like? And he just said, it's worse than it looks. <laughs> <laughs> and his, his timing was perfect. And it was just, but again, it was like the suit, you know, he had the suit and he looks like he's going to talk about like, you know, impeachment or something. Sure. He just looks so serious and that's why he has that going for him. The other politician who I think was genuinely funny, but only in a really mean way, which I really appreciate. And I sort of feel like if I ever, <laughs> if I ever ran for office, I think I would have been this kind of politician because yeah. this was a guy who would sacrifice votes right and left if it meant getting a Get laugh. And that was actually Bob Dole. And wow. Bob Dole okay. Okay. was, I mean, no one will ever say like, oh, yes, that funny man died. Because right. most of the things he said were just really mean. Because yeah. he was one of the angriest people <laughs> in politics. He had a real, you know, he had a, an, a war injury from World War II. He, had a, he was from Russell, Kansas. And he's always like saying, Russell, Kansas, 
we didn't have food, we ate each other. You know, it's, you know, it's just like, that's not a joke, that's just like something he would actually say. You'd like kill your brother and eat him before lunch. We didn't have the, you know, meals that you guys, you know, it was just like always like, I, I really, I mean, it gives you an idea of what I do with my life. I recently watched like his debate with Walter Mondale from, from 1976 when he was running for, for fun. For fun. It was because it was performance art, like everything out of his mouth. Like Walter Mondale actually seems like a pretty nice guy. And even though it's a debate, like Walter Mondale is trying to be kind of statesmanlike. And you know, everything out of Bob Dole's um, mouth is like, says, well, maybe you say that's what Republicans doing. Because they're not trying to destroy the country like you are every day when you wake up. <laughs> You know, he's just like <laughs> going after him. He's such a hatchet man. He's so horrible. But here's what I mean about his being, being those are examples of him not being funny, him just being conceptually funny because he's just so crazy. Just so mean. So like mean. That. But here's an example of a mean joke of his I actually really liked, which was that he was at a state funeral for some, um, for some dead foreign leader. I can't remember whom. So the venue's right. The venue's right for laughter. You're already juiced for a good laugh, for a zinger. <laughs> and he said, there I was. Three ex-presidents were there. Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, Richard Nixon. See no evil, hear no evil, and evil. <laughs> good night, everybody. <laughs> oh, we got one more. One on Bob Dole. Stock 2023. Yes. 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 Yes.